Thank you, thank you. I'm Father Mitch Packle. Welcome to EWTN Live. And we have just a few more days until Christmas. So we wanted to have a little bit of a special EWTN Live program where we look at the birth of Jesus Christ, particularly in the context of the land of his birth, the Holy Land. And before we get to that, I just want to welcome our EWTN Radio General Manager, Mr. Jack Williams, uh, because he wants to let us know about a lot of special Christmas programming you can find on EWTN Radio coming up. Jack? Father Mitch, thanks for the opportunity. It's great to be here on the Christmas extravaganza. Blessed Advent to you as well. (laughs) Um, You know, we uh, we do have some very special Christmas programming coming up. You know, our listeners and our viewers may not be aware, but we have actually eight full-time, 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week radio programming playouts that we produce. And I have a great team of people uh, that work with me that make all of that happen. Our director of programming and production, Mr. Tom Price, who's been with the network for over a couple of decades now. Uh, A lot of the heavy lifting behind the scenes gets done by our director of radio operations, Mr. Mike Peters. Got a great team of producers, including Michael McCall, Rich Jesse, uh, Jeff Burson, Michael Birchfield, Ryan Penny, and... um, Spanish language, you know, yeah. Doug Archer, our director yeah. of Spanish language yeah. programming, uh, he and Katia Valino and Jorge Grania do a great job with our Spanish programming. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, we had to go find an old Catholic school teacher to keep us all in line, and that's Miss Deborah Rice, who keeps everything flowing the way it's supposed to down there in the, in the department. But we do have some very special programming coming up on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. We're calling it the 48 Hours of Christmas. It's the last, we did it last year, uh, overwhelming uh, approval rating from uh, our listeners, and we're going to do it again this year. There'll be some uh, Christmas music, some sacred music. We'll have um, specials. Uh, The mass will be sprinkled in there, so it'll be a real treat. So people can just log on to EWTN.com slash radio and check the air times that, uh, well, it'll be Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. So if you're watching the program, uh, before Christmas, then you can take advantage of that. If you're not watching the program before Christmas, then you missed out, and you need to make sure you tune in next year uh, to be yeah. able to do that. And if you're in an area uh, where you are not able to get EWTN Radio on one of our AM FM radio affiliates, then give me uh, send me an email, and we can talk to you about maybe how the Lord may be calling you to play a role in bringing EWTN Radio to your area, and they can just send me an email at jwilliams at EWTN.com. And also to remind people, too, there'll be a lot of specials on television as well. Mm-hmm. So EW10 Television, EW10 Radio, we want to make this a holy celebration Amen. of this season. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you, Jack. Thank you, Father Mitch. We're going to be back in just a couple of minutes to talk about and show images from the Holy Land. So please stay with us. Welcome back. And this is where, for the rest of this program, we would like to take a look at various parts of the Holy Land that we'll hear about in the Gospel texts and pray about, hopefully, throughout this season, and see the connection with the historical reality. There's a wonderful book by a Benedictine priest, Father Bargel Pixner, which he called the fifth gospel. What he meant by that 
is, of course, there are only the four written Gospels. But the land itself is a Gospel. It, it is something that, from, by knowing the land of Israel, you better understand the events of the Scriptures. That was a book I read many years ago and reread. It was just a wonderful book. And I also came to believe that he had a very important insight about the role of the land. So I'd like to begin where the Christmas story really starts, which is in Nazareth. Nazareth is a town up in the north. It's on a long ridge. So it's up high. And below it, on the, to the south of Nazareth, is the plain of Jezreel, a very fertile area. And with that, you go up you know, the, the road to the town of Bethlehem, and at the town center is the Church of the Annunciation. This church is built over a series of much earlier churches. There was a church built back in the 1700s, and then before that there was a medieval church built by the Crusaders that got destroyed, and then there was also a Byzantine church built back in the 4th century, and then there was an earlier church from the second century and one from the first century. And what's the center of all of those churches? It is the grotto, or part of a cave, where the Blessed Mother lived. She, like pretty much most of the people in Nazareth, lived in caves. This is a limestone kind of mountain or, or ridge. And when the, uh, it was covered by the ocean, that's how you get limestone, that it was covered by the ocean back about 35 million years ago. And as the water receded back and forth, these caves were formed. And here you can see an image of the grotto. It's down at the lowest level of the church. And people built their homes. So the famous home of Loretto would have been a house that would be built up against the cave. And the cave was part of it. And people, and you can see, if you go there, on the outside of the church, you can see the caves that were homes for the neighbors. The neighbors' houses are still there. And you can see the holes in the ceilings of the caves for their hearth, the, the cooking fire and such, the doorways, the little path that they had to go to from one house to another. This was the kind of place where Our Lady lived. And in fact, people had been living in caves in that area going all the way back to the Stone Age. So it's a very ancient uh, place of settlement, but the town called Nazareth was started less than a hundred years before Our Lady was born or lived there. It was a relatively new town. When you say the name Nazareth in Hebrew, it is pronounced Natseret, Natseret. See, there are two Z sounds in Hebrew. One is like our Z and would be Nazaret. That would then be derived from the verb meaning to take a vow. And this was some people thought. But a very old, from about the year 200 A.D., very old list of the towns included Nazareth 
And you can see on that list that they use the other Z sound, which is Natseret. Now, why is that important? Because the, the root of the name of Nazareth is the Hebrew word Netzer. Netzer. And you can see if you go to the book of Isaiah, chapter 11, beginning with verse 1, it says, A shoot shall come from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Now, Jesse, of course, was the father of King David. And Isaiah was warning that the family of David would be cut down. The family tree would be cut down to the stump. But because God had made a promise to David, there would be a new shoot coming out of the stump and it would become the new tree. Well, the word for shoot is the word Netzer. Nazareth is a town named after the shoot from this passage. And there was an expectation of that shoot from the stump of Jesse to come forth in Nazareth. And we may even wonder, I've often wondered, whether a number of people, uh, in fact, during an earlier period, a lot of people from Judah went up to that region and settled. That would explain why someone like Joseph would be living up in the north, even though he's a Judean from the house of David. He would move to this town, Nazareth, that is named after the shoot that would be the new beginning for a new line of David's family. Also, there was plenty of work to do because you know, just a, a mile and a half, two miles away, there was a, a town that had been destroyed in a, a, re, a Jewish revolt against the Romans in 6 BC, and it was being rebuilt. So Carpenter would have plenty of work to do there. You can go and see that ruin, in fact. So that sort of gives us an explanation of why these folks are there and that there is this sense of expectation. It also explains why in the Gospel of St. John, Jesus said, or that John says that it was prophesied he would be called a Nazarene. That is someone from the shoot. It's referring to that prophecy in Isaiah 11. Now, of all the places where this could happen, why do we think that this is the cave? There are lots of little house caves in Nazareth. Why do we think this is the right one? Well, first of all, Christians had been worshiping there all the way back to the first century. There's a baptistry a place where they baptized the early Christians in the, from the first century. There are mosaics inside the church showing where the Christians had been in the first century and the second, and then rebuilding in the fourth, and then the Crusades, and then in the 18th century, and then again today. So this is, uh, you can see, if you look in this picture, you see some of the ruins of the Byzantine church are still there, those pillars are from the fourth century church. So you have that. But one of the most interesting things is that when they built this new basilica of the Annunciation, they were going to dig all the way down to the bottom. That's when they found this first century stuff, including at the first century level, they found a piece of pottery also from the first century. And this is a shard of pottery about this size. And it's inside the museum there. And written in Aramaic is this verse from the prophet 
Isaiah, where he says in chapter 7, verse 14, the Lord will give himself a sign, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. That is on a piece of pottery that was found underneath the floor, it had been lost for centuries. From the first century, it had been laying there all the way until the 1960s when they began to excavate to make the new church. And they found that. And that little bit of pottery with that prophecy about the virgin bearing the one who is called Emmanuel, which means God is with us, that became one of the greatest points to know that this is the place. The early Christians remembered that this was the place where the Annunciation took place. And in that chapel, there's an altar inside the grotto, and it says in Latin, the, this phrase that can only be said there, it's written there, can't be written anywhere else, where it says, hic verbum caro est, that here the Word was made flesh. That's the place where God became flesh in the womb of the Virgin, and that the word of the angel Gabriel to Our Lady, inviting her to be the mother of the Redeemer. And she hears those words. You can see on that picture, there's that plaque right in the altar. Here, the word was made flesh. It is so powerful a thing to stand there. And I've celebrated Mass at that altar a couple times. And to be able to know that when we eat the body and drink the blood of Christ, we can do that because His flesh, or He took on flesh in that place. And this reality of Christ becoming of, of God becoming man, God taking on human flesh and dwelling among us is a reality that makes our salvation possible. And He dwelt among us first in the womb of Mary. Now, the Word in John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word means He made His tent with us. That is made all the more rich by the sense that the Blessed Mother carrying him in her womb is like the Ark of the Covenant. In the Old Testament, the Ark of the Covenant was in a tent, and it was the covenant made in stone. But now we see that the Word becomes flesh, and he dwells inside the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And since Jesus is the new covenant, she, she becomes that Ark of the New Covenant. In fact, uh, we didn't get to get pictures of it, but there's even a church west of Jerusalem that is called uh, the Church of Our Lady uh, of the Ark of the Covenant, which is built at the place where the Ark of the Covenant was uh, stationed before it was moved to Jerusalem. And we should think about that caring of Jesus. As we hear the Christmas story, and we hear how they had to come down from Nazareth, a three-day trip, probably when she's with child, maybe an extra day, a four-day trip or so, and she's carrying God within her, this new covenant, God the Son, who's become flesh within her. And in that sense, she is also like a, a, a even greater than any of the tabernacles we make. By the way, the word tabernacles, such as we use at church, means tent. 
So that sense of the Word becoming flesh and tenting among us is also something that we understand as part of this great mystery. Now, before they even made their trip to Bethlehem, we also know that Our Lady made the journey down to the hometown of her kinswoman, Elizabeth. Sometimes it's translated as cousin, but it's just a more, more general word than cousin. It's just kinswoman. And she goes down there because the angel Gabriel had mentioned that uh, six months earlier, Elizabeth conceived a son even though she had been called sterile. And that shows that nothing is impossible to God. And at that point of accepting with faith that nothing is impossible to God, she says, let it be done to me according to your, to your word. And she conceives. And there's nothing said about how she felt or any experience. But we know that she goes down to Elizabeth. And there's a town called Ein Kerem. This also has very ancient churches there to commemorate St. John the Baptist. And at these churches, they uh, recall John the Baptist uh, and the visitation. Now, one church is the church of the birth of John. We won't get into that. But there's a church of the visitation that's across the valley from the church of his birth because it said that Elizabeth had gone into seclusion, and that seclusion would have been across the valley. And you can see a picture of that church. I, I really love that, that church very much. It's a good walk to get up there, but uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful walk. And the meeting of Our Lady and Elizabeth at that church is truly terrific. Some of you have seen it when we're uh, doing the Holy Land Rosary, for instance. And with this, we see that a couple things go on. First, they have a chapel of the visitation where Elizabeth met Our Lady. And the important thing about that visitation are the first, the Holy Spirit acting. He comes upon Elizabeth and the baby within her womb. And the baby leaps. In fact, inside the church is a great uh, picture of Elizabeth all bent over because the baby's jumping so hard this poor old lady is bent over. She greets Our Lady. But then the Holy Spirit not only gets the child to leap like a lamb, and the word for leaping is a word that is used for lambs when they leap, scortize. If you've ever seen sheep or lambs, when they get really excited, all four legs come off the, the ground. Uh, you, you see that with a few other animals. Mule deer do that in this country, but lambs will just all four legs come off the, the ground because they're really excited. And that's the word for John jumping up and down. But when the Holy Spirit has his influence on Elizabeth, then it's a different influence. She speaks three beatitudes. The first beatitude, blessed are you among women, meaning she's the most blessed woman of all. It's an Aramaic idiom to say that, the, that Mary is the most blessed woman ever, more blessed than our mother Eve, who was, by the way, con created without original sin, but fell into it. Our Lady is more blessed because she was conceived without original sin, but she never fell into any sin. That makes her more blessed than Eve or any other woman. Secondly, blessed is the fruit of your womb. And, of course, we've incorporated both of those into the Hail Mary, though one uh, of the great saints, St. Saint, uh, uh, Bernardine uh, of Siena, added the word Jesus 
so that we honor the name of Jesus in addition to the blessing of the fruit of her womb, namely the Lord Jesus. And then her third beatitude is, blessed is she who believed what the Lord had said to her. And that last blessing in particular, we honor the first two blessings, but we're supposed to live that last blessing. As a matter of fact, if you look at Luke chapter 11, when the woman in the crowd says, uh, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast that nursed you. And Jesus responds, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. He is not excluding his mother. He is highlighting his mother because she was blessed for, obey, for believing the word of God. And we get to share in that. Christ extends that blessing to all of us. And as we hear these words of God, as we go to Holy Mass in Christmas season, let us allow those words of God to become blessed, sources of blessing for us because we believe that word as Our Lady did. So these would be a few reflections for each of us to have. And I'll take a little break now but we'll come back and take a little bit of a look then at the nativity and the reality of the birth of Christ at Bethlehem and the date of Christmas and the shepherds. So stay with us. Thank you. Welcome back. Um, I'd like to now switch our attention over to the little town of Bethlehem. It's actually not so little anymore. It was little in the time of Christ, but it's, it's not so little anymore. Now, first of all, it's important to keep in mind that Bethlehem was the town foretold as the place of our Lord's birth. If you take a look at the prophet Micah, and I'm sure that you will have heard this already, but if you go to Micah chapter 5, verse 2, where it says, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time when she who is in travail has brought forth. And then the rest of his brethren shall return to the people of Israel. He shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth." This prophecy by Micah was given in the second half of the 700s B.C. 700s B.C., so it's well more than 700 years before the birth of Christ. And probably about the 720s or so. And 
What's interesting in that regard is that the reason that Mary and Joseph go to Bethlehem is not because they say, well, you know, the angel Gabriel said that he's going to inherit the throne of his father David. I guess this is the Messiah. Let's go to Bethlehem and try to make the prophecy get fulfilled. That's not why they went. They went because Caesar Augustus had this decree for enrolling people. In fact, we know that Octavian, Caesar Augustus, did want to have a census in the world. He wanted to know how many people there were for taxes. That's why governments do census. They want to tax us. And the, the, every government loves our money. And so uh, that was very true with the Roman government. They wanted taxation. And so they, because of the taxation, they had to go to the place of Joseph's origin, which would, would be uh, Bethlehem. And what's important to think about is that Caesar Augustus or the governor Quirinius we're not thinking, well, let's see, let's help the Jewish people fulfill the prophecy about their Messiah. Are you kidding me? No way. No way. They didn't know about Jewish prophecies about the Messiah. And the last thing they would want is to help promote some other guy calling himself the son of David, and the one who will sit on David's throne for all eternity, forever, they didn't want to promote someone who might end up being a rival king. That had nothing to do with that. This is the way that God's providence takes a situation where one group of politicians has their own will, and they're trying to do their own thing, but they end up enabling the fulfillment of a prophecy about the Messiah being born in Bethlehem that had been spoken more than 720 years earlier. That's truly amazing. And they go to, uh, uh, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because Joseph was of the house and lineage of David, to be enrolled with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to be delivered. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in a swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them at the inn. So this is where they go. Now, this place, you know, and the manger is very interesting. We see, for instance, in the nativity set that I have here on the, the table on the set, that it looks sort of like a, a barn, and there's Christ in a manger. Um, the, uh, a manger comes from the French word manger, to eat. And this is where you put feed for animals. So that's what a manger is. In the Holy Land, there are a lot of mangers from ancient times that you can see. For instance, if you go up to the city of Megiddo, up in the north, uh, famously known in the book of Revelation as Armageddon, or Har Megiddo in Hebrew, um, there you can see a lot of mangers for the horses because they uncovered the ancient stables and the mangers are still there because they made the mangers out of stone. They would carve a solid stone and carve into it to make a place to put the horse feed, the hay and, and other feed they gave horses. Oats, oats are good for horses, gives them good protein. And they fed the horses from that. And the interesting thing is, in the cave in Bethlehem, there is still a manger 
also made out of stone. There's a second major, when they, uh, when St. Helena discovered the place of the birth of Jesus, she found two mangers in it. One she sent to Rome, and that is still to this day in the church of St. Mary Major, one of the four major basilicas, and it's the church of St. Mary Major that was built uh, in the, uh, uh, I believe, 431 to commemorate the Council of Ephesus decreeing that the Blessed Virgin Mary is the Theotokos, or the bearer of God, the mother of God, and that that title was given at the Council to, to make clear that Jesus is a divine person. He's, he's, uh, his person is God, and Mary is his mother. So they, that's when they built that church, and that manger is in that church. But we uh, see the other manger is in Bethlehem. Now, there's no way to know which manger our Lord was in for sure. There are two mangers, um, but uh, the, and one, uh, and one's in Rome, one's in Bethlehem. We just take them both. But they found those two inside the cave. That's how we know that the cave had been used as a stable. But how do we know that that is the cave of the birth. Well, here's one of the interesting things. The early Christians went to that cave to remember Christ back in the first and second century. And this was something that bothered the Roman Emperor Hadrian. He, the, he also did not like it that the Christians were going to worship at Mount Calvary and at the tomb of Jesus. So what did he do? To try and stop the Christians, you can, uh, what he did is built a pagan temple over the tomb of Jesus and Mount Calvary, put him underneath the temple, and then he also did the same in Bethlehem. He put a temple or to Adonis over the place of the birth of Jesus. Now, that was around 135 A.D. that Hadrian did that. But the Christians still remembered that that's where it was. They just couldn't go and worship there anymore. Well, in 325, 190 years later, when St. Helena came to the Holy Land to build these uh, uh, ch churches to honor Jesus, she asked the Christians, where is the tomb of Jesus at Mount Calvary? They pointed under the temple. Her son, Constantine, was the emperor, so he had the temple destroyed. And sure enough, there was the tomb, there was Mount Calvary. She did the same in Bethlehem. They said, where is the uh, place of Jesus' birth. And they said, it's under the temple of Adonis. She had that destroyed, and sure enough, underneath was the cave with the two mangers. So this is how we know about the place. And she built a church, and in fact, part of the floor of that church is still there. There, uh, they got destroyed by the Samaritans in the 500s, so Justinian built a new church. And the church of the nativity that you see today is built over the cave. And that is the oldest church in the Holy Land. The Persians invaded the Holy Land in 613-14, and they destroyed every church in the country and killed tens of thousands of Christians. This is the church built by Justinian back in, in the uh, five, uh, hundreds, 550s. And they didn't destroy this one because in there were mosaics of the Magi. The Magi were from Persia and they were wearing Persian clothes. And so, 
the Persian army said, oh, they have pictures of our homeboys. So they didn't destroy it. And they left the church alone. And that's why we still have that church today. And we see that this is where Our, Our Lady and St. Joseph stayed when Jesus was born. Now, after a while, after the birth and all, they would move to another place called the Milk Grotto Church. But you can see here, this is the entrance into the cave. This was cut out by St. Helena. St. Helena had this entrance so people could walk in See all the people standing around? They're facing the manger. Where they are is uh, uh, toward the manger, right underneath that. With it. Oh, excuse me, right now they're looking at the star. I'm sorry. They're looking at the star of Bethlehem. That's where the, the marking the place where Christ was born. And then over to the other side was, is the manger. And they put a baby Jesus in that manger, and they leave it there. You can... Uh, that. that uh, that's right, uh, the star of David, the uh, star of, of Bethlehem. And people venerate that to mark the place of the birth of Jesus. Uh, it's one of those uh, f- uh, three or four places in the Holy Land where you can take religious goods, you just place it on there, and it's blessed. You know, that, that's, that's such a holy place. Well, this is pointing out for us you know, the sanctity of the place and how the earliest Christians kept remembering this. And the same is true for the shepherds and the shepherd's field because at the place where the shepherds met with the angel, early Christians built churches. There are the ruins of a number of monasteries, but even a first century baptistry because Christians went to the shepherd's field in order to be baptized, received into being members of Christ and his church. And it's a a wonderful place. I, I love the shepherd's field. There are also a number of caves there. There are caves all over the Holy Land because when the ocean did recede 35 million years ago, it was, it was under the ocean for about 5 million years. That's a pretty, pretty long time. And at the shepherd's field, um, you can the, the, these caves, and the shepherds bring their sheep uh, to stay in the caves at night. Uh, because that way they're protected from the wolves and the jackals and the uh, panthers that are in the area. Now, but let me just say this. I've heard some people say, well, Christmas could not be in December because shepherds don't stay around Bethlehem in the wintertime. Eh, wrong answer. Every winter I've ever gone to Bethlehem, there have been shepherds in the fields, right, right there near Shepherd's Field, that uh, you, can, uh, you can see them there all the time. Uh, so that's, that's just not true. That, uh, I've, I've, every time I've gone there, they're, they're there in the winter. Uh, so that, that's just silly. Um, and what we can do then is see that there's also at Shepherd's Field, not only these caves where the shepherds would have been with their sheep, and they would have been laying in front of the cave entrances. Remember how Jesus said that I'm the good shepherd and I am the door for the sheep fold? Why would he say that? Well, here's why. Shepherds would lay down in front of the cave at night and their sheep would come and walk over them and they would recognize their own shepherd's smell. Everybody has their own special aroma. That's why dogs and cats sniff us. You know, they they remember our aroma. And the sheep do as well. 
and they would come to where their shepherd was, and he would be, uh, by laying in front of the cave, he was the door to the cave. That's what our Lord was talking about. He was like those shepherds, and that he would be in front of the entrance of the cave to protect them from the wolves and the jackals and the panthers. Because there still are panthers, by the way, not that far away from Bethlehem. Just I've been in their area. Uh, in the past. So this is something that they would do. And they're just minding their sheep when the angels appear. And there's a great chapel that is at the shepherd's field known as the chapel of the angels. You see there's an angel above the door. This is on the hill above the cave to commemorate that the angels appeared above the shepherds. You can see that angel at the front. And on the inside, there is a whole array of angels with the words, Gloria in excelsis Deo, glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. That that angelic hymn was taught. But first, the angel comes to the uh, shepherds and says, be not afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, that which will come to all the people. For to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe raped, wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. This is what they are to look for lying in a manger. That's going to be the sign. And they're, of course, afraid. I mean, it's a frightful thing. In fact, there's a great uh, uh, painting inside the Chapel of the Angels that the shepherd's sheepdog is baring his teeth and growling and, and barking at the angels because he's going to be there to protect the sheep. But then in the next picture, when they go to Bethlehem, the dog is sitting quietly, focused on the baby Jesus in the manger. And he is supposed to be the way all of us are. This disruptive news that the Messiah has come means that we have to make a decision. And a lot of times our human nature is just like that, that watchdog. We don't want to lose the stuff that we think we already have. And we're going to protect the stuff that's ours. And we're going to bark at God and bark at the angels and bark at the Bible and bark at the church and be against anybody who preaches things that we don't like to hear because I like my sins and I'm not going to change. You can't make me. We're, we're like that dog. But then when he does come to Jesus with the, uh, the shepherds, he's standing there calmly staring at the child Jesus. You know how dogs, when they become fascinated with something, they just stare. And as he stares at that uh, baby Jesus, you see that this contemplation that he's doing is also supposed to be a symbol of what we do in this Christmas season. We too are supposed to contemplate Jesus. This is what will bring us peace. I know that this is a time where we want to take care of our family. We want to buy them things. We want to be generous to them, and that's a good thing to be generous. We have a lot of special recipes. We're working hard to prepare a celebration and make it very festive and have our families and make lots of food and lots of cookies, and it's a lot of work. But we have to make sure that we're not like barking dogs who are protecting our image of what it should be but instead, contemplate Jesus himself. Focus on the child Jesus, who became flesh in the womb of Mary, but then left that womb to come into our world and did so with the poverty of being laid in a manger, 
with these with the animals around and being surrounded by shepherds with their sheep and as we focus on him he will bring us peace it's not the running around the shopping and all that that brings peace that's nice to do it's fine but it is that focus on Jesus that brings peace to our hearts. And then you also see in that same chapel that the third picture is one of the dog leaping for joy with the shepherds who are singing and playing music and banging tambourines and playing their flutes because that's where the joy is celebration. That's when we sing joy to the world. We don't just have Muzak forms of that that we keep hearing in the department stores. We go away from the, the public where we have a lot of these secular Christmas songs that, that are fine and dandy, you know, uh, I'll be home for Christmas and white Christmas and all these sentimental things that are warm memories. That's a nice, it's fine. But what we want to do is as the fruit of our contemplation of Jesus to be able to shout out joy to the world. Yeah, we begin with the contemplation of Silent Night, who's, by the way, it's the 150th anniversary of the composition of one of the most popular hymns in the whole world. We celebrate that quietly but then we also go to uh, glory in excelsis Deo, joy to the world, and all the other wonderful Christmas songs that focus us on Jesus. This is going to be what makes our Christmas a delight, and that our celebration of Midnight Mass or one of the other Masses, or more than one Mass, you can go to three Masses on Christmas. And there are different readings for each of the Masses at midnight, early morning, and late morning. Celebrate and rejoice in this great feast. Enjoy your families with great joy. And together sing those Christmas carols with the joy that comes bubbling up from God. And may Almighty God bless you this Christmas and throughout all of the year in your whole life, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and by the intercession of the Holy Family, make your families holy too. God bless you.